started to save us all, all some time, I'm going to um, recite the open meeting law script here. Good evening. <clears throat> this open meeting of the finance committee is being conducted remotely with consistent with Governor Baker's order of March 12, 2020, due to the COVID-19 virus pandemic. In order to mitigate transmission, we've been advised that and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public, all public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with the agenda for this meeting and in the materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment only in writing by email to tbradley at town.arlington.ma.us.com. This meeting is convening by video conference via the Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that the meeting is being recorded. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public's encouraged to follow along using the post the agenda until unless the chair notes otherwise. Before we read, before we turn to the first item on the agenda, some ground rules. Uh, the chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda, and then after they conclude their remarks, the chair will invite the members to provide any common questions or motions. Please hold until you recognize your name's call. Further, uh, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're speaking, and please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Let me also note that I have uh, asked Tara and Annie to keep an eye on the screen. If I miss people who have raised their hand, they will uh, remind me. For um, any response, wait until the chair leads, yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. Uh, each vote at this meeting will be taken by, uh, conducted by a roll call vote. So now uh, let, uh, allow me to confirm that all the members of the, meet, of the committee are present. When I call your name, please state in the affirmative that you are here. Uh, Grant Gibeon? Here. Shane, Shane Blundell? There. John Ellis? Makaya Healy? Yes. Brian Beck? Arif Padaria? He will be over in just a moment. <laughs> Who will be over? Arif will be over in just a moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Sophie Mick Dazzle. Yeah. Jonathan Wallach. Shailene Pokris. Daryl Harmer. Here. Andy LaCourt. Here. Alan Jones. Here. George Koser. Here. Bill Keller. Here. Al Tosti. Here. Wanda Nascimento. Christine Deschler. Here. Dean Carmen. Here. Uh, David McKenna. Here. Thank you. So uh, for the record. Hey, Charlie, I just joined yeah. Arif Padaria. Arif, okay, Arif is here. So for the record, I have uh, John Ellis, Brian Beck, Jonathan Wallach, Shailene and Wanda as uh, not present at the moment. So uh, let me make a couple of comments before we attend to the minutes. Um, first of all, I, I think I sent a note out today. There's a budget and revenue task force meeting tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, if you feel like attending, please do so. It's a good opportunity to see our legislative delegation respond to questions about what they're doing in, at the state house and how it's affecting Arlington. Uh, <clears throat> so I'd like to address a, another subject of process that 
um, hasn't hasn't gone probably as well as it should have, largely due to me. Um, earlier this evening, I sent you two emails, one of which was sent this morning and one of which was sent on the 11th of February. But due to some um, lapses on my part, me, e email communication difficulties, I didn't get to see this until late Monday night. Um, in addition, I received two related communications several weeks ago, which I interpreted as communications to me as opposed to the Finance Committee, although right now I'm not certain that's the case. I should have made a clear determination at that time as to what was the case, but consequently, when we take up the Planning Department budget this evening, I will ask the committee after our deliberation, if it should, uh, if we should get through the deliberation tonight, to take the budget until the next meeting, which time we will vote on the budget. In the meantime, I'll undertake some communication with the writers of the emails to determine if they have specific recommendations for the Finance Committee or whether they're simply trying to create a general concern on the part of the committee. Um, and in the future, I think uh, I'm, and I'm addressing this, I guess, to myself and to Tara. I want to make sure, and to any, any, anybody on the committee, if we get communications from the public, please make sure Tara gets a copy and then we'll make sure that they get distributed as soon as possible to all of the members so that we can formally um, dec decide how to deal with them on a timely basis. The Finance Committee has an obligation to the community in general, as well as the town meeting to carefully consider information from all quarters that affect or reflect the finances of the town, especially in consideration of our need for an override in the near future. However, in doing so, we must draw a careful line between evaluating such information in order to carry out our mission and interfering in or micromanaging town departments or other town boards or committees. So at our next meeting um, on the subject of the planning department, we can evaluate what, if any, actions by the finance committee are required or appropriate. The reason that we're not doing this tonight is that we haven't had the opportunity or through the circumstances that I described to post that information uh, on the website uh, two days in advance of the meeting. So we'll take it up at the next meeting. So uh, minutes. Uh, can I just make a quick uh, comment, Charlie? Uh, who is, I'm this sorry. This is Tara, sorry. Yes, Tara, go ahead. Yeah, hi everyone. So um, we have been trying to work out a listserv in Microsoft as well as some, um, as well as, uh, kind of like calendar invites within Microsoft. Um, and in doing so, some of you may have received some links to a uh, Teams meeting. Um, and so we, we think that we've worked out the kinks on that at this point. Um, and it looks like there might be still a few more kinks to work out with the distribution list. Um, so we will keep working on that. Um, so that is just something I wanted to bring to everyone's attention. And then Charlie, we just had four more people join, which were uh, Jonathan Wallach, um, Shailene Pokris, um, John Ellis, and then uh, Wanda Nascimento. Thank you. And uh, I also note for the record that Don Seltzer, a member of the public is attending the meeting. So um, minutes. Yes, um, let me uh, let me pull those up. So um, first, we have minutes for February the 9th. And those have been sent out last week and then with updates just um, yesterday or last night. Um, and then we also tonight have meeting minutes for Monday's meeting, which I don't know that everyone will have had time to review. Um, so to start with February 9th, I have okay. them up here. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. So are there any comments or um, uh, changes proposed for the minutes as presented for February 9th? Hearing none, uh, motion on minutes of February 9th is in order. Um, is there a second? A first second. motion and a second, right. So the, it's been moved and seconded to accept the minutes of February 9th. Ant Gibeon? Yes. Shane Blundell? Shane? Oh, he's not here? He's here. That's what I thought. 
He's on mute. He's, he's gesticulating muted. wildly. Okay. Uh, John Ellis? Yes. Micaiah Healy? Yes. Uh, Brian Beck is not here. Arif Padaria? Well, I'm here, but I wasn't here for the last meeting. But I'll say yes. So you're you're going to abstain? Is that what I hear? Okay. Abstain. That's the Miliazzo. word I was looking for. Thank you. Sophie Migliazzo? Uh, yes. Uh, Jonathan Wallach? Yes. Shailene? Yes. Daryl Harmer? Yes. Annie LaCourt? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. George Koser? Yes. William Keller? Yes. Al Tosti? Yes. Wanda Nascimento? Yes. Christine Deschler? Yes. Dean Corman? Yes. And David McKenna? Yes. Thank you. Um, there were, um, all, all the votes were positive except for one abstention. So the minutes are accepted. <laughs> uh, do you have the minutes for uh, Monday night? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, is, is there anybody had a, not had a chance to review these minutes and there uh, any, uh, pardon? Charlie, had a, one, I wanted to thank Tara for putting all the voted taxation numbers into the budget, so into the minutes, they'll be very useful. And, and I pointed out in the table at the bottom, there was a typo, the comptroller numbers uh, oh, okay, is, thank is you. wrong. I just sent you an email, Tara. Okay. Sophie? Yeah, I was gonna send Tara a, a little modification too, that I haven't had a chance to. Okay, then let's postpone these minutes until the next meeting and she can take care of those in a orderly fashion. Okay, so the first budget tonight uh, on the schedule is the uh, police budget. Um, Daryl, is that yours? Yes, it is. Uh, Tara, I'm, excuse me, I'm going to share my desktop. Okay, yep, you should be all set to do that. Give me a couple of seconds here. Okay, can everybody see the budget book for police? Oh, income questions. What page do you want to be looking yeah. at? Now you should see it. Can you see it now? Yeah. No. Okay, so it's it's uh, page one thirteen is the first page. So the the police budget um, is actually pretty uninteresting. Um, uh, I'm going to go into some of the other uh, topics that are more interesting uh, a bit later. So as you can see, the only uh, on the, the salary side, um, uh, there is a change on the, on the personnel side of, of about 1.6%. Uh, there was a question on uh, the variances in court time uh, that I'm gonna talk about a bit later. Um, so, and then essentially most of the other accounts are just level funded. So any questions on the salary side? Any questions on the salary side for Daryl? Yes, Alan. I'm just wondering, uh, there was a huge or substantial drop of about $400,000 from 2020 to 2021 actuals, and then about a $900,000 increase in the 2022 budget, which is, I assume, because the, the patrolman's contract finally got settled. But um, I, I just wanted maybe a little bit more explanation on that, please. Um. I'll actually have to go back and look at last year's um, budget. I assume it's, it, it is because of the contract. But I'll have to go and back and look at my notes from last year. Vacancies. Any other questions? So um, I have a, a sort of related question, Daryl. Um, if, if you go to the next page, uh, I think it's the next page. No, the one that has the list of personnel. 
Yeah, down at the bottom. Yeah, you've already highlighted it. I did the same thing on my copy. So um, there are a lot of vacancies. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, okay. All right. So um, are you going to pursue the answer to Al's question? Yes. I, I, yes. Um, okay. On the expenses side, um, there's a lot of moving and shaking, but it's really just um, lining up uh, new accounts uh, and moving money into um, accounts that uh, the comptroller is standardizing across state departments, uh, um, town departments. So, geez, old life creeping in. Um, I just wanted to call out one of the um, topics, and you'll see this with the fire budget too, is. Um, uh, pulling back maintenance money into the central facilities budget. Um, that, that accounts for the $28,000 uh, reduction. Um, one of the issues that both police and fire um, are having is sort of working out kind of what the dividing line between um, what's in, what facilities takes care of and then what each of the departments take care of. Um, uh, facilities seems to be orienting more towards prevent, preventive maintenance uh, whereas police and fire are kind of focusing more on actual um, expenditures on equipment or whatever, but they're they're working through uh, what the dividing line is there. Um, there was a question on parking fund offsets that I'm going to deal with uh, later too. So, are there any questions on the expenses side? John Ellis. Uh, sorry. Uh, I, uh, Daryl, I wasn't quick enough on the um, salary one. The uh, injuries went up from 40,000 to 195,000, but there's nothing in the 22 budget. Is that because the injury costs are completed and we, we just hope nobody gets injured or would potentially costs continue? That's 5114. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll have to ask about that too. Okay. Nice. Okay, I'll, I'll get back to you on that, John. Okay, yeah. That, that, that Makaya, good. you have a question? You're on mute. Thanks. Uh, just an education question about uh, what stipends are used for um, as opposed to overtime. Just curious about that. Um, I think it's just various um, amounts of money attached through the contracts for these various things. So for example, accreditation is for uh, education, different um, classes that they take. Are you referring to 5160? Uh, yes, 5160. Which is I, can, I can I can ask into that too. Okay, because it's different than we, just, 50, we didn't bring it up. Okay, just different from fifty one oh nine, which is the accreditation. But thanks for asking, Sophie. Just respond to that. I'm guessing it's like in the ones we saw in our budgets, which is related to uniforms. Um, and so in our budgets, there were like eight hundred or four hundred dollars that we reviewed. So I would I wouldn't be surprised if. It, Obviously, it's a lot more for the police department. It, it could be. It looks like they renamed some of these line items too. Well, Fifty-one forty-one is clothing. But for all the people in the uh, police department, fifty-one forty-one might bu might buy a. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Not not a lot of clothing. Let's put it that way. <laughs> for all all of those personnel. Okay, so um, Charlie. Yes. Oh, um, Andy, go ahead. I'm sorry. So um, I, I I believe that at least some of that stipend amount can be explained by things like um, a pay differential for officers who learn how to use um, the portable uh, heart starting equipment and other things like that. So uh, a lot of those kinds of training things were. 
um, come with an agreed upon stipend or pay differential in the contract. Thank you, Manny. Uh, Charlie? Yes. Uh, just to add to, to Annie's comment, in certain positions within the police department uh, have additional stipends attached to them. Um, and additionally, um, there's stipends for, for carrying a handgun. There's a stipend for that in addition to the salary. So it, it varies. Um, there's, there's always been different type stipends for different type positions within the police department, and it's all done by contract. So that's that's what the stipends are all about. It's not it's not really about clothing because they have their separate line for clothing allowance. Thank you, David. Any other questions for Daryl? I see Alan Tassi has his hand up again. Um, I don't know if if we know this, but are stipends taxable? Are they <clears throat> part of their regular salary? Yes. Yes. The stipends are, are taxable. Hey, are they considered part of your regular salary for pensions? No. Uh, stipends? Yes. Certain, st yes, certain stipends are, are included in, in the, um, for pension purposes. I wonder then why we just don't include them in the salaries. <laughs> because they're negotiated. It's negotiated. We bargained. It's not, it's not a question of just sitting down and doing something. Any other uh, questions for Daryl? So Daryl, you're gonna, um, I think we've answered the stipend question. And um, so we're interested in knowing about that major swing in the salary line, uh, 5,100. Yeah. Um, what was uh, John's question again? Um, uh, injury. The injury. The injury. Oh, the injury. Oh, the injury. Yeah, oh. injuries. That's right. Yeah, th is that that looks like a reclass that went somewhere? It had to go somewhere else, but we'll see. Yeah, I, I'll I'll ask the chief. Okay. And there's a new rule here. You can only ask questions that I can actually answer. So, okay. Um, any further questions for Daryl? Okay. So, um, let me go through. Um, uh, I think Al last week asked um, uh, for an explanation for. Um, the wide variance in court time costs um, that were um, much higher in um, uh, 2019 and then dipped hugely in 2020, 2021, and then went back up in uh, 2022. So when I asked the chief, she she gave the answer that was of course incredibly obvious once I realized that, that um, in 20 in 21, the courts were closed because of COVID. So I went back and pulled uh, some of the historical data and you can see that um, the uh, budget amount asked for this year 37,142 is uh, pretty much in line with uh, the traditional spending um, and it was really 2020 and 2021 that were the anomalies um, and also that the original budgeted amount for 2020 was the 37,142 so um, it's really just um, uh, restoring spending back up to, to traditional levels now that courts are opening again. And then there was another question on the parking fund offset. Um, parking control officers themselves are fully funded from the police budget and the offset covers expenses such as ticket rolls and scanners and things. Um, so does that answer those two questions from the review we did a couple of weeks ago? Any further questions on, on those items? Sophie. 
Um, I thought one of the questions on parking was why we have some parking control officers in the police department and some in a different department. I don't know if that came up or not. What are you referring to? Are you referring to the parking parking budget? Yes, I think so. I think I yeah, I, I had asked like why was this other parking department there, and then and how come the expenses were, were not there? And then I remembered that it's all a lot more complicated, and there's this parking fund that that that, that gets spent on redevelopment of Arlington Center, and I realized there's much more complicated thing. But at the time I was looking at that parking budget and thinking it was odd that all of the parking expenses weren't in the same place. Well, the parking, yeah, traditionally the, the uh, parking budget uh, was for the enforcement of the um, parking tickets and summons. The, the parking clerk traditionally was the, the uh, treasurer, okay? And if you look at if you look at parking budget, it's really one person. Um, there's not a lot of a lot of people there. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes. It's Dean. Can I just add one? Oh, Dean, Dean the former treasurer. Yes, go right Jack, ahead. Let me just and I think to put it in like a really simple term, um parking enforcement is a police power and so it goes into the police budget. Parking administration, so post ticket administration is a civilian disposition matter. And so it goes under the parking slash treasurer's budget. And so, you know, and the two reasons it goes, the two primary reasons administration is in the treasurer's budget. It's first, from a cash handling perspective, you want money going through the treasurer's office, not an intermediary step. And secondly, if you feel like you've been aggrieved with a parking ticket, um, primarily because like the most common one is like the wrong, they got the license plate wrong and you end up getting a ticket. Um, that's the most common grievance I saw. You really want a civilian looking at that. You don't want a member of the police force um, having to rule that one of the officers made a, a, a clerical error. So like, I think that's why you separate, that's why you separate enforcement and administration. Hey, thank you, Dean. Micaiah. Makai, okay, you're on mute. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, Daryl, do you know why the firearms and ammunition budget has gone up by almost six thousand dollars? That's concerning. Uh, Fifty-two, fifty-three. Yes. No, I'll, I... uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, Alan. Uh, just to comment that the 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 ninety five sixty is the actual expenditure, whereas the fifteen thousand was the number budgeted. Right. So, in other words, the whole I, I don't know what the budget was in twenty twenty one, but it may not have been. But let's not compare actuals and budget. That's a good point. Um, I would love to know um, sort of the breakdown of the calls. I you know I know that Arlington usually gets a lot of calls with um you know substance use and mental health uh, but just if you could explain a little bit more get some more clarity about the the, the use of uh, of that but that point well taken makaya what is your question about the mental health uh that it's that was a side side um thought but just wondering about that actual budget number versus the actual um what, uh, what, I'm, what I can't uh, I can't follow which actual budget number you're referring to. 5253. 5253. Okay. And what does that have to do with mental health? <laughs> the the calls that police take um, usually receive and the dispatch. Um, I would I would be curious to to find out. Um, Sort of the breakdown of, about the calls and the actual use of firearms in um, Arlington Police Department. 
So I, the first thing I would suggest is that um, Christine and Daryl and Jonathan did a report on the police department about um, about 15 months ago. I think oh, uh, a year ago, August, if my memory, memory serves me right. So uh, I, I think some of that data, they look back over 10 years and, and that's pretty, uh, um, it was pretty comprehensively discussed. So and that report is on our um, SharePoint site under last fiscal year, I believe. Is that right, Christine? Yes, and, and can I just make a, a, a comment? Um, yes, by all means. Makaya is correct that the Arlington Police, uh, we are fortunate that they rarely ever use firearms when they respond to calls, but the po patrol officers are constantly uh, needing to practice. Um, and train. So um, I, I, I believe that this is 52-53 is to pay for the, the, the practice ammunition and firearms. That would be, that would be my guess, my understanding. Thank you. Alan. Yeah, the, uh, the fiscal 21 budget was also 15,000. Oh, good. Thank you for that. Any other questions for Daryl on the police budget? Okay, if not, I'm going to go on. So um, on vacancies, um, uh, there are 10 total vacancies. Um, <clears throat> Six are being um, taken care of with trainees uh, currently in the academy, expected to graduate at the end of June, uh, and then they'll start a 12-week training program. So they'll basically be on uh, fully on board by the um, end of the summer. Um, counting for those vacancies, two people retired, uh, a couple retired uh, resigned to um, go to other towns and one resigned to take a position in the private sector. Um, there are four remaining vacancies, um, three patrol officer and one sergeant. Uh, the sergeant's vacancy is gonna be filled through promotion. Um, then in terms of filling the other three vacancies, um, one of the issues is um, uh, the department prefers to hire residents of Arlington, uh, one they have priority and two residents of residents of other towns um, usually prefer to go back to their, that town when openings come up there. Um, so they've got 11, 11 residents lined up to uh, take the next civil service test, which will be in March, and to help these um, candidates um, take the test. Arlington is collaborating with Belmont and Billerica and Bedford uh, to offer a test prep class. So uh, hopefully um, the uh, six, six of the vacancies will be filled by the end of the summer um, and the other four, um, I guess it would be probably in the fall, winter, by the time they get through the academy training and um, the, uh, the training program. Um, Carol, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, if if you're gonna, if these are, are going to be filled by the end of June, shouldn't they shouldn't be in the budget as vacancies, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's how they're, they're typically reported. It. Um, oh, oh, okay. The, the, they're. Yeah. There is a name vacant, but the but the money's there to pay for them. That's right. Okay. Yeah. I misspoke. All right. Yeah. Um, then in while the 10 vacancies um, are close to being addressed, um, there is an ongoing issue in terms of hiring and retention. Uh, it's gotten increasingly competitive. Uh, towns are offering signing bonuses and educational benefits. Um, about 40 towns, 40 police departments have left civil service um, and I've listed some of the uh, neighboring towns. 
um, which gives them um, more flexibility in terms of recruiting and retaining. Uh, if Arlington were to leave, uh, desire to leave civil service, uh, would have to bargain with the unions or the town manager to propose a warrant article. Um, and if the department were to leave civil service, they could do their own exam, their own recruiting. Um, at this point, it's, it's just being considered. Um, there's no decision been made yet on um, if, if they want to go that route. But um, uh, civil service is one of the areas the police reform um, is addressing. And I'm actually going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. So any, any questions on vacancies? Any more questions on vacancies? If, if um, Jolly. Oh, wait, hang on one second. Dan, you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah thanks, Charlie. Just curious sort of how do we determine how many patrol officers we need is it sort of by like population or sort of how was i know we're like we have a bunch of vacancies we're holding them but how do we like how do we make that determination of like is it a per capita just curious if there's anything you can offer yeah, I, I i have no idea um i think i could answer that but probably the best head answer would be david mckenna um in the past it's been what they call per unit of population determines how many uh, police officers we have. We had police officers going back into the 50s and 60s that were almost uh, the uh, patrol officers were to was over 60. And of course, that, that's been decreased over the years for many years. But it's, normally it's per unit of population um, determines patrol officers. And usually there's a two, two to one split for every. Um, patrol officer, there's a ranking officer, which includes sergeant, lieutenant, or captain. The other thing I wanted to mention was, historically, you're going to see that there's always vacancies in both the police and fire. Um, going back to... Well, he's frozen, but I, I do appreciate his... Uh, right when it gets to the interesting part. <laughs> Thanks, okay, Dave. David, we lost you again. <laughs> so, uh, Sean, Shane, there's one other thing uh, that. Uh, Hello. Yeah, are you back, David? Yeah, I I can't tell when I fade out, so just. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, you're fading out again. Okay. Uh, maybe we'll just move on from that question. Is that good for you, Shane? Yes, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Daryl? Okay, then um, issue from last year is body cameras. Uh, so we went through with the chief what the, the updates on the current plans are. Um, so at this point, most towns are trying to do pilots. So even getting the cameras uh, is about six months out. Um, the department has researched uh, about three or four vendors. They've identified a vendor. Um, uh, they've met with the unions who seem to be generally supportive of using the cameras. Um, they haven't bought the cameras yet. I do want to be clear about that or the uh, associated hardware uh, and uh, software. Um, I think we went through this last year. They're, they will be using um, the asset forfeiture fund to pay for the hardware. They can't use that fund for software or storage. Um, they were funded $47,000 at last year's, for software at last year's town meeting. And they were awarded a grant from uh, State Office of Public Safety uh, for software. Uh, they got the grant uh, middle of December. They have six months to um, sign an agreement with both unions or um, they'll lose the grant. Um, so they essentially have to uh, get those agreements signed by around June. Um, they've developed a draft policy on, cam on camera usage. Um, you'll see there's an additional complication there. And it said the town is bargaining with the unions. Um, so as part of police reform, um, the state has mandated a study to develop uh, uniform policies for uh, both buying and using cameras. Um, that study is supposed to be completed in June. Um, uh, so I think at this point, um, you 
and everything's on hold waiting for that study. Um, the state is um, going to mandate that um, municipalities follow uniform uh, policies for both uh, buying the art, buying the equipment, and then also the usage. I'm actually going to talk about police reform at a high level in just a second. So, any any questions um, on body cameras? Oh, wait, um, Shailene? Yep, I was just about to unmute and say, excuse me. <laughs> uh, yep. So given that the state's doing this study, um, I'm wondering if th that study will impact Arlington's ability to use cameras or like the technology itself and um, whether the finance committee should take that into consideration in, in terms of like asking the police department to delay an investment in cameras. But it sounds like they also have money from outside of what the finance committee can is it, it's possible most of the funding is coming from this grant and from uh the 47k for software but th my general question is like if this is if there's still pending items uh guidelines how does that affect do are we approving money ahead of time for that um i don't i don't I think there's any new money in the in the 23 budget request, um, and I don't think they know in terms of um, this study what's going to be in it and um, whether it will actually be done in June. Um, so I think there's there's some open issues there, um, and I, I don't know specifically. Um, whether um, municipalities need to wait for this study to be done I, in, the, in terms of the actual legislation, um, uh, or whether it's really just dependent on getting to agreement with the unions. I think that's really the controlling factor. Right, okay, thank you. Thank you, Shailene. Other questions, uh, Alan Jones. Thank you. Um, do you have any idea of the cost of the hardware that's being paid through the as a forfeiture fund? And is, uh, would that be a, a camera for every patrol officer or how many how many cameras would be purchased? I believe it's a camera for every patrol officer and I think uh, the cruisers as well. And do you have an idea what the total cost of that is that would come out of the fund? Out of the asset forfeiture fund? Um, I don't know. And it also, it, it, some of that depends on um, the amount that's in the forfeiture fund at a given point in time, since it, it varies depending on whether they've gotten any asset forfeitures. I mean, do, do you think that that would be on, an ongoing source of funds for camera replacement? In other words, would that be the, the long-term source of funds for the cameras or would that be added to the expense line at some point? I'm just wondering if that's a, that'll be an ongoing expense for the department and get an idea of how much that would be. I'll have to ask. Okay, thank you. Jonathan. Yes, uh, thank you, Charlie. Um, following up on on Alan's comment. I'm not sure, Alan, whether that would be ongoing. If it's not covered by asset forfeiture, I'm not sure whether it would show up in the operating budget or in the capital budget. I, I, I think you're, you're right, Jonathan. I mean, um, we have some uh, current police items that are purchased in bulk that are capital items. I think, for example, bulletproof vests, as I recall, right? And firearms, I believe. And firearms, you're right. So, and they have to be, um, they, they all have a lifetime, five or eight or 10 years or something like that. And that's probably true of the cameras as well. So maybe in, in answer to Alan's question, it might be that it, that it becomes a capital item. Okay, and go ahead, uh, Daryl. Um, so I'm going to go through this really quickly. Um, there are some areas of police reform that 
um, touch on some of the issues that we've talked about. Um, I put um, uh, some materials in um, in our SharePoint site, um, a copy of the actual um, the actual legislation itself, Senate uh, twenty. I can't just see the. Um, The, uh, the gallery is covering um, where the bill number is, but I think you guys can see it. Um, so that, that bill had an emergency preamble, so it became effective at the end of December 2020. Um, it creates a ton of commissions and task forces um, to study and come up with recommendations on a huge variety of issues and concerns, structural racism, bias, diversity, transparency. Um, increasing police accountability, um, establishing policies for um, use of force and the rules for use of less lethal weapons, uh, limiting no-knock warrants and banning racial profiling, uh, limiting the use of facial recognition software, although not banning it, um, and another commission to study the use of it. Um, and here's the uh, body camera um, uh, task force to develop a uniform code for the purchase and use of the cameras, uh, develops uh, requirements around storage and transfer, and then also discipline for uh, not using cameras correctly. Again, the goal here is to come up with a uniform uh, set of uh, policies and procedures and requirements. Um, one of the issues that directly touches on uh, hir hiring and retention is um, a review of the civil service system and recommending changes to improve diversity, transparency, and better represent the community, and also updating policies for hiring and training. Um, so that kind of goes to the concerns that the police department has about civil service, hopefully um, improving it. Um, and then one of the major um, issues is um, there is a one of the 18 commissions is called the Peace Officers Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission or the POST. Um, and the goal there is to certify officers statewide. And you can see that the, uh, the, the composition of the POST and that it has subpoena power to investigate misconduct. Um, within the POST, there is um, uh, there will be a division of police certification uh, that will create a mandatory certification process for police officers. Um, uh, all officers will have to be certified. You won't be able to be appointed as a law enforcement officer unless you are. Um, and then the, uh, um, the uh, ramifications of being decertified are huge. Um, decertified cert officers would be ineligible for appointments to law enforcement agencies, police schools, and academies. Um, certification um, would be suspended um, if um, the officer was arrested, charged, or indicted for a felony, fails to complete training, and then other conditions. And then the certification can be revoked for conviction of a felony, uh, misuse of force, or engaging in the conduct of a hate crime, uh, failing to intervene to prevent another officer from engaging in prohibited contact. And then there's a huge list of other conditions. Uh, there are processes for um, uh, appealing both suspensions and uh, revocations um, and um, uh, getting suspensions lifted and so on. Um, then the other, uh, the other issue that the chief brought up is that um, uh, there's no, at this point, there's no sort of standard training curriculum across the various academies in the state. And um, the uh, police reform bill is also creating a municipal police training committee um, that's uh, actually within the state uh, executive office of public safety. It's not part of that post commission. Uh, you can see the committee members and um, the purview uh, is all municipal transit um, UMass police officers, not the state police. Um, and then uh, they'll set policies and standards for the screening app screening of applicants um, to, to certified academies, minimum certification and use of four standards. That is jointly with the post and then uh, maintaining uh, records of training and certifications and so on. 
So that is a really high level view of uh, police reform. As I said, um, I did put um, uh, the legislation itself and other articles and things. And there's a, a summary, which is actually longer than the bill itself, um, that the police chief of the city of Chelsea did, um, which is it's, it's more an, annota an annotated version of the bill. Uh, so it's very helpful um, in kind of going through and um, making sense of it all. So um, I have exhausted my knowledge of the police reform bill. So uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll uh, um, write them down and um, give them to the chief. Grant Gibbon. Yes. Uh, I. It Daryl, I appreciate the Daryl Harmer rule. I'm going to use that at the water and sewer about the only allowed to ask questions you know the answer to. And now you're going to break it, right? Well, no, no, no. I'm hoping not to. Um, help me understand with the civil service, the other communities have gotten away from civil service, and that's because it's easier to hire or they can hire. Why is that better for those communities, I guess? Um, so I'll speak to my experience with civil service with the state. Um, See, uh, you get answer. <laughs> um, a lot of times with civil service, you end up having to interview candidates that really aren't qualified um, but for various um, preferences and other things. Um, they come out. Uh, they come out on the top of the exam. Um, so civil service, um, you know, goes back to the early 20th century, um, and um, it hasn't changed much since. And so it's a it's a pretty rigid system. Uh, okay. And, so, so, so it limits the hiring pool, basically, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, so I think the hope is that with if Arlington were to 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 leave if the Arlington Police Department, it needs to be that doesn't mean the entire town would leave. Correct. If the police department were to leave, they'd have more control over the tasks and uh, recruitment and things like that. Okay, very good. Thank you, Daryl. See, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. John Ellis. Um, uh, sorry, you, you said it, it was a bill, but it was it passed. I missed that part. Yes, it was passed and signed by the governor in December of 2020. Okay. Okay, great. Yep. And, uh, you know, regarding the uh, body cameras, no questions. Pretty straightforward. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, John. Sophie? You're on mute, Sophie. Hi. So, I just to make confused on the discussion about civil service, because I thought town meeting just went back to civil service a couple town meetings ago. And did the finance committee discuss this then, or what was? I'm just surprised it's coming up so quickly. Um, well, it's a little complicated. I don't believe that the police were ever out of civil service, but um, about 20 years ago or 30 years ago, when the uh, there was a Department of Community Safety and a division and a police division, the uh, chiefs were not members of civil service. They were um, they were just not not in civil service. And, uh, and about 10 years ago, there was an impassioned uh, plea, um, might have been Brian Sullivan, I'm not sure, but whoever was the town manager at the time, to have the chiefs become part of civil service. So both the chief, the fire chief, and the um, police chief became part of civil service. And then um, uh, four years ago or so, um, the Board of Selectmen recommended that the police chief not be a member of civil service. Um, and the town meeting supported that. So where we are right now is I believe the fire chief is civil service and the police chief is not. Okay, thank you. But I, 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 I just do want to be clear that um, They've, they've taken no action at this point to to leave civil service. Right now, it's just it's a point of uh, concern and some frustration. Um, leaving civil service is an option. Um, they have not decided. They haven't made any decisions about 
going that route. And, and to do so would require um, a collective bargaining over the issue. Yeah, like she said, collective bargaining or um, a uh, warrant article. And I asked if, if the warrant article would essentially supersede the need for collective bargaining. And she said, yes. Yeah. So, um, oh, that's interesting. OK. Yeah. All that's right. Well, th thank you, uh, Daryl. That's very, uh, first of all, thanks for putting all that good information on the SharePoint site. And thank you for your excellent uh, description of the Police Reform Act. Um, so any other questions for Daryl on police reform? I just want to point out that um, I believe Dave McKenna has joined with his telephone. Um, so if he is back in and he can hear us, if he wanted to say anything, um, he could try to do that right now. I just want to know, can you folks hear me now? Yes, yes we can. Okay, um, I'm, I'm attaching two cans with a string. <laughs> and that's how I'll communicate. <laughs> okay. No cartons work better, Dave. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Um, okay. All right. So, um, Daryl, go ahead. Okay. So I move that the um, uh, the 2023 police budget be approved as printed with an amount of eight million. Can you show that page, please? Oh, I'm not. No. He is. Oh. Yes, he is. Yeah, it is. That's the, that's the page. Oh, you're right. Thank you. Sorry. Um, eight million eight hundred nineteen thousand three hundred and twenty-one dollars. Second. So it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? So um, I I just want to give the opportunity to the members to. Um, speak to to uh, to hold off the vote on this if they if they feel any of the questions that Daryl has agreed to go back and um, investigate for us would change their opinion on this on this vote. Um, are there are any, any such objections? Okay, hearing none, it's been moved and seconded. Any further questions or discussion? Hearing none, we will vote on the police budget. Grant Gibbion. Yes. Uh, Shane Blundell. Yes. Jo John Ellis. Yes. Kaya Healy. Yes. Arif Padaria. Yes. Sophie Migliazzo. Yes. Jonathan Wallach. Yes. Shailene Pokris. Yes. Daryl Harmer. Yes. Andy LaCourt. Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. George Koser? Yes. Bill Keller? Yes. Alan Tosti? Yes. Wanda Nascimento? Yes. Christine Deschler? Yes. Dean Carmen? Yes. And David McKenna? Yes. Uh, the vote is unanimous. Uh, thank you. The uh, police budget is passed as recommended for uh, $8,819,321. So the next budget um, is the fire budget. Thank you, Charlie. Um, can someone put that up or can I share my screen? You can share your screen if you'd like to. Uh, I can also put it up. Can everybody see that? Yes. All right, well, like the police budget, there's not much going on here in the fire budget. On the salary side, there's very little change. Um, and that's because um, they're, the, uh, they're out of contract in the process of negotiating a new contract. So every there, there's no cost of living or other kind of across the board uh, increase going on um, from 22 to 23. 
So the small increase you're seeing for salaries and wages is just a, a few minor step increases. Um, and, uh, and the same with you know, school credits and, and uh, longevity, those are just small changes that are contractually required based on the, the former contract. Any questions? Jonathan, do you know how much of the overtime budget is actually used? I'm sorry, what your question again, Charlie? Uh, do you know how much of the overtime budget is actually used? For example, last year, I noticed that it was 582,669 and for the last couple of years, it's been 478,000. 470,000. Uh, last year, the budget was 478. I do not know to what extent um, overtime is, um, you know, exceeds or is less than that. Well, budget I guess, that. yeah, we're still in fiscal year 22. So, yes, we are. You wouldn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can tell you that um, um, in 21, they were over budget um, on overtime, but did not have to uh, take a reserve draw because um, they did not fill all the vacancies that they had included in the budget for fiscal year 21. So they offset each other. Thank you. Okay. Um, Moving on to expenses, uh, nothing happening here other than um, um, what Daryl talked about for the for the police budget, which is that um, they've shifted ten thousand dollars out of the fire's maintenance budget and um, shifted that over to the facilities department facilities budget, and like with the police. Department, as Daryl mentioned, the fire chief, Chief Kelly, is um, they're they're trying to figure out how to make this work. Um, and with right now, the the basic model is for facilities to pay for preventive maintenance, as Daryl mentioned, and the fire department would pay for equipment repairs or other minor repairs, but. They are still trying to figure out how this is going to work. Uh, any questions? Any questions for Jonathan on fire? Yes, Sophie? On the fire expenses. Yes. So I'm just looking at this. Um, and it seems like the budgeted amounts are always the same. And the actuals on certain lines, for example, 5203 or 5206 are much lower than the budgeted amount. I'm wondering why are we always, I mean, is this historically true? Were, were the, I wasn't on the committee before, so I don't know, but did we always budget those same numbers as we're budgeting now and they always spend less? And is that the best practice? Um, I can't speak generally to that. Uh, all, all that I can say is that uh, actuals rarely match Budgeted. <laughs> um, well, Sophie, I, I think this was a, this is a reclass. You'll notice that budget fifty two ninety nine was in this several thousand level, and and the repair and maintenance was very small. And now that the um, repair and maintenance went at fifty two oh three went to four thousand, but the otherwise unclassified is zero. So I, th I think this is deriving from the um, the, the comptroller's. Um, efforts to have more accurate expenditure classifications. Okay, thank you. Shane Blundell. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, thanks, Charlie. John, uh, hospital and medical care, um, what is that actually pay, paying for? Is this for, for, for medical care for the staff or, I mean, I see a spike in 21, but like, what is it actually covering? Uh, I, that's a good question. I am happy to ask the chief what that represents. 
Thanks. So um, this is a question actually retroactive for Daryl as well as for Jonathan. Um, I noticed that the auto and gas, auto gas and oil budget for um, fiscal year 23 is the same as fiscal year 22. And didn't we have a big run up in the gas prices in the last year, like twice? Fuel costs. My un understanding, we, we talked about this at one point, this is probably several years ago now, um, but my understanding is that, um, so the town buys, it's a centralized purchasing, and then the dollars are allocated. Um, and so, um, you know, it's, it's um, why that they're, why they're showing a, a level allocation to these departments and to other departments that I don't know. But okay. my understanding is that, um, Purchases are centralized, and and then, um, um, and then the, the budget dollars are allocated to the various departments. It, it may be that they also have a forward contract that's taking. That they, it, it could be. I just I don't know. At an earlier time. Okay. Um, any any other questions for Jonathan? On oh yes, Shane, you still have your hand up. Sorry, I forgot to take it down. Okay. Thank you. There's Al Tosti's hand up, Al Tosti. Yeah, I, I think also uh, the, the only vehicles that were using uh, gasoline last year were the police vehicles because everybody was home because they couldn't go anywhere. So I think if you take a look, the gas prices were much lower last year um, than now. And to a certain degree, they're coming back to more normal, uh, maybe a little above that. But last year, the gas prices were just down. Um, Bill Keller. Uh, no, I raised my hand and I'm trying to lower it. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Daryl, is I, your hand up or? <laughs> yes, it is up. I have a question for you, Charlie. Actually, do you want um, do you want Jonathan and I to go back to uh, Chief Byard and Chief Kelly on the auto and gas question? I, I think that would be a, a good idea. I'm just okay. uh, concerned that uh, uh, you know the. It seems to me the other day that the, the price of oil has gone up to $100 a barrel or something like that. So there's been a 40% or more appreciation in the recent periods. So we should try to understand uh, if that's going to have an impact on, okay. on the departments that are doing, uh, you know, running vehicles. So go, go ahead, uh, Jonathan. Okay, move, moving on to the last page. Um, I just want to, well, Here's the last page. Um, there, there are currently eight vacancies um, shown here on the on the personnel sheet. Um, all eight of those vacancies have been filled, um, and those um, future firefighters uh, are will be starting in the academy within the next uh, few months. Great. Good. Okay. Um, any questions on the personnel side for for Jonathan? Of, uh, personnel side of fire. So, Jonathan, are you uh, prepared to make a recommendation? I am. I'm recommending, as printed, the uh, fire taxation total of $7,742,205. Is there a second? Second. So it's been moved second, seconded for $7,742,205. Any further discussion? Um, there are two questions that were raised for uh, Jonathan. One is an explanation of the medical expenses cover, and the other uh, was related to the fuel uh, inflation. Uh, is there anyone who wants to put a hold on this budget pending the answer to those questions? Seeing no hands, we will move forward and take a vote on the fire budget. 
Grant Gibbian? Yes. Shane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Mike Micaiah Healy? Yes. Arif Padaria? Yes. Sophie Migliazzo? Yes. Jonathan Wallach? Yes. Shailene Pokers? Yes. Carol Harmer? Yes. Andy LaCourt? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. George Koser? Yes. Bill Keller? Yes. Uh, Alan Tosti? Yes. Wanda Nascimento? Yes. Christine Deschler? Yes. Dean Carmen? Yes. And David McKenna? Yes. Uh, the vote is unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, a curiosity question. Um, Arif, where are you? I'm at my home in Mumbai, India. Greetings. <laughs> Thank you for joining us tonight. You're welcome. Happy to be here. Okay. Uh, the next budget is okay. Planning uh, and development. Plan, plan, uh, planning board first, I guess. David and Sophie. Okay. Yes. Um, you want me to I'm pull gonna, up the uh, budget? I'm going to refer this to, to, to Sophie <laughs> as she will present right, this budget. You can please pull up the budget. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> um, <laughs> page 70. Okay. So, starting with salaries and wages. Um, this is explained in the budget explainer that we received during the town manager's presentation to the committee, uh, specifically that the staff roster now show now displays a CDBG administrator, which is offset fully by the CDBG funding. So um, that's the bulk of that additional there, and then it comes off in the offset section, um, which you'll see there. And in, in the additional changes in the salaries were just a, a few step increases. Then there was a position with some new hires. So they came in at lower uh, salary positions and that, that's why it doesn't come out exactly um, dollar for dollar uh, number there because of those other little changes. I don't think there's anything else in the salary section. Um, the stipend is just in the union for the union employees, it's just contractual and in, in there. Are there any questions on salaries? Can you flip to the uh, salary page, please? There you go. Okay. Any questions for Sophie on the um, salary page? Yes, Al Tosti. Yeah. Um there's a new community development block grant administrator for 71,000, which accounts for the increase in planning budget. What, what is this position for? Um, don't remember exactly, Dave. Do you, can you explain that or not? I, I, I didn't realize that that's, that's a new position. I believe that position has been around for a while, Alan. Um, right. This is new person doing it. The it, um, it, it's I think the I community that. block grant. I think right. Yeah, it can be yeah, I, I could explain that. My sis, I, I believe that what's going on here is that that position is now showing in the budget with the offset, and it probably used to just pass right through the CDBG budget. There's been a CDBG administrator since at least 2005. Right. So it's not a new position. Right. It's not a new position. What was explained is this is part of the transparency and wanting to have everything out there because it was 100% offset before they never showed it. It didn't show up on here, even though it was there. So for transparency going forward now, they are showing it in the salaries and then we see the 100% offset on, on this document. So it's not a new position uh, per se and it's it's right. 
Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions on the planning budget? Shane Blundell. Thanks, Charlie. Um, I guess I understand sort of what the broad purpose of the department is, but sort of like anything to like say like on the years ahead, I mean, we have like a sort of pretty substantial change in like the law around like affordable housing. So like, I guess sort of what's on the horizon for the department? Like what are they? It's maybe less a finance question, but sort of what like what are some projects that are ahead of them? Just curious. Right. Um, well, there was a, a question from the committee. I, I don't. Uh, that some I think John had asked about the economic development coordinator and sort of what's in the process there. And I think the discussion they gave us there gave us a, a broad idea of, of all the things they're working on. Which um, so if I can answer that now, that was they're currently they got a bikeway grant an Arlington Heights grant, a grant for funding the various parklets that we've seen with COVID to allow for outdoor dining on parking spaces. They're very busy right now with um, loan assistance and uh, an economic development task force, the permit processing for outdoor fitness because Arlington actually has quite a bit of few businesses that are fitness oriented and with the COVID restrictions that was really affecting those businesses. So this um, department has been very busy, you know, making sure those businesses have help in the permitting process to have access to our outdoor space. Um, they've been working on relaxing rules for outdoor dining. And right now um, there have, they've gotten $750,000 to allocate through the ARPA money. Um, to give out grants of a maximum of 10,000. And so they've received 170 applications for those grants. They've been going through them. It looks like 83 small businesses and nonprofits are gonna be receiving grants. The monies will be going out in March, I believe. Um, uh, the funds will be dispersed in early March. So they've been extremely busy and I think that's just going to continue um, going forward on the economic development side. Thanks. Answer your question. Yes, thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. So, Shane, um, I sort of to add to that, um, I distributed to the committee tonight uh, two emails that uh, I received. And also, as I mentioned earlier in my opening comments, that I received some prior um, comments about the planning department. And um, the, the emails that you saw had some various, uh, uh, use the term discontent with combination of policies and expenses. And um, I don't wanna go into it tonight because nobody's had a chance to read them and I haven't had a chance to research it myself either. And it was, they weren't on the agenda, but I, I, think, I think we have to uh, put those on the agenda at the next meeting and determine whether we have a reaction or not. You know, that's just, um, maybe, we, maybe we don't do anything or maybe it requires further uh, understanding. So, and that has to, what I'm trying to address is your question about what's the global view of the planning department and where are they going? And I think some of what, what they're doing is buried in those emails. Thanks. So, yeah. And Sophie, what else, what else do you want to tell us here? So also in the horizon, they did point us out that um, in our books on page 201, there are a couple of warrant article appropriations, 100,000 for blue bikes, um, 50,000 for design standards. And as a committee, we'll hear more about those when they come in for those warrant articles. But um, those, I guess, are projects on the horizon as well for that department that we'll hear about. Um, so so should I move on to expenses? Anybody? Yes, please. Okay. So quickly, the repair and maintenance, it's the same 500 because they did not spend the 500 on the desk they were wanting to buy. So we're just seeing that same request over again. Auto allowance is just mileage um, as they go around to meetings. Uh, dues and subscriptions, this is a significant increase. And this is because they have three new employees who are all members of the AICP, American Institute of um, City Planners. And so there are increased dues and fees related to those, but obviously we benefit from having 
um, employees that are members of, of that association. And training is additional dues for different associations and for training costs. Um, office supplies go up because now there's more in person and so more office supplies being used. Uh, line 5236, Conservation Commission expenses. This has to do with training specifically for the uh, Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commissions. Uh, and 5354, Technology Economic Development is specifically a CoStar software fee um, for, for one of the softwares that, they, they, that runs their site and information on all the vacancies in town storefronts that they manage um, and deal with. And also an economic development software fee uh, for, they had a three-year contract. This is the last year. It's not sure they're gonna renew it on that one. Um, that's still in discussion. So those are just really specific to software fees. One thing about vacancies is they did mention that obviously there are more vacancies now because of COVID and storefronts in, in the enforcement of, of some of the fees on those uh, vacant storefronts has been were suspended, but they're now coming back into place. So they're busy um, reaching out to all those people, making sure, you know, some will put artwork up in their vacant storefronts to, uh, instead of having fees or fines. So they're busy, they're very busy with that right now. And I think that takes me through all the expenses if there are any questions. Any questions for Sophie? Yes, Alan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, just for, for, sometimes it's difficult to describe what planning and community development does, but I would commend people to look at our award-winning annual report. I just counted, there's 26 pages on planning and community development. So it goes into you know hundreds of projects and things that they uh, help coordinate. So, Give that a try. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Did you get that, Shane? Okay. Uh, I, did. I did, yes. Jonathan. I um, don't want to jump the gun on those emails, but um, um, I just wanted to uh, get a clarification. The, the cost for um, planning studies or, or consultant, pay consultants to do studies, I thought that was in the capital budget, not in the operating budget. The, Charlie, the, is that true? Uh, it, it depends on the it depends on the studies. Uh, sometimes they're in capital. It, generally speaking, if a study, I mean, this is the way I record policy. Okay, if a study leads to a capital project, in other words, uh, uh, let me take the infamous Sims uh, project. Right, we. So we, we had a very expensive study process there, but it was leading to some capital project behind it. That can go into the capital budget. I believe that the Government Accounting Standards Board says that if it's not going to result in a capital project, then it has to be expensed in the operating. Okay. And if, if consultants are part of the operating budget, what line item would they be? Well, that's a good question. We uh, we have to, that's what I want. I didn't want to discuss this tonight. Oh, okay, sorry. A little bit of research. I, I, I will hold off. I, I can tell you that some of these studies come out in, um, come up in uh, warrant articles, okay? They're not capital, they're just a warrant article. So gotcha. We understand what we're doing. And some of them come from CDBG. So uh, we should, I don't want to, we shouldn't be sort of uh, addressing something we haven't thought about, is what I'm trying to say. Plus, hey, thank you. you have to notice the public appropriately. Other questions for Sophie? All right. Alan, did you have another oh, question? I see your oh, hand. Alan, is your hand up? He's, he's not up. Okay. Um, so. I, I did there, Charlie. There were two other questions that came up from the committee um, that Go I was going to One was whether any of these positions actually were temporary positions that were supposed to go away. And they assured me that no, that that was the case, maybe in health and human services, but not in this department. None of those positions were ever temporary. Um, and then there was, I believe you had brought up a, a, a 
community comment about a zoning board working group comment um, and concern that they couldn't bring up costs um, at that meeting. And that was confirmed, my suspicions were confirmed and that that is purely a, a legal sort of issue of the Fair Housing Act, which prohibits discrimination um, on a variety of factors. And so when they are talking about zoning during the zoning board working group, um, they cannot address certain uh, topics, including uh, family makeup and composition and age, um, et cetera, because that would be discriminatory and talking about zoning. So uh, it's an interesting comment. So, so um, okay, when you're specifically talking about zoning. Correct. When you're when you're speaking about specific. Right. So, in other words, you can't you can't zone a district for uh, senior citizens only or for um, single people or something like that, right? Your fair housing, you would you have to be in compliance with the Fair Housing Act, which prohibits discrimination. So. Okay. Good. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm going to uh, suggest that we not vote on this tonight. We'll put a hold on this. We'll vote at the next meeting after we address those other questions. Um, and uh, the next budget to move forward on is also uh, your budget. And I assume that David on his phone, on his uh, tin can and wire is, um, David, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, so did you want Sophie to move forward on the redevelopment budget? Yes, if she would, please. All right. Thank you. I do want to um, at least notice to the committee that I, as a town meeting member, have a warrant article up before the ARB. Um, I don't believe there's a conflict because even if they vote no action, I would just uh, bring it as a substitute motion. So if everybody is okay with that. Charlie, should I do Are there any uh, objections to Sophie discussing this uh, budget? No. Okay, you're clean. Thank you. Um, so the redevelopment board budget is pretty straightforward. Uh, no changes actually at all. Um, no percentage change, although, yep. It, it, the, we discussed changes between the actual and the budgets. Uh, office supplies, again, the difference being that they are now going to be in person. And line 5228, it says ballots, but it's really about all the town meeting costs um, associated with printing things for town meeting. Are there any questions? Any, any questions on the um, redevelopment board budget? You want, want to make a motion, Sophie? Sure. So I recommend as printed the redevelopment board budget of a total of um, 10,800. Second. So it's been moved and seconded for the redevelopment board budget for $10,800. Any uh, additional comments? Hearing none, I'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Grant? Yes. Shane? Yes. John? I'm here, sorry, yes. Thank you. Makaya? Yes. Uh, Brian Bexman. Arif? Yes. Sophie? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Um, Shailene has just left uh, the meeting. Daryl Harmer? Yes. Annie, Annie just left the meeting. Uh, Alan Jones? Yes. George Koser? Yes. Bill Keller? Uh, yes. And uh, Al Tosti? Yes. Wanda Nascimento? Yes. Um, Christian, uh, Christine Deschler? Yes. Dean Carmen? Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. Okay, the redevelopment board budget for ten thousand eight hundred dollars is unanimously passed by all the members uh, in attendance. So thank you, Sophie. Um, the next is the uh, next subject is the reclassification and pay schedule. Micaiah. Uh, thank you. This is Micaiah. 
I want to first um, bring up the two questions that were raised with the Human Resources Department budget. Um, let me see if I can just find my notes. I won't be sharing my screen. I'll just be looking at my my notes. Would you uh, like me to pull up that uh, reclassification document, Makaya? Yes, okay. um, but but not but not not yet. Okay. Let me just um, so the. There's two questions that were asked about the training budget for the HR department. Um, and uh, so the context of that was if if um, Karen Malloy was uh, um, ex thinking that she was going to exceed her $50,000 and asking um, why not ask for the full budget request right now. Um, and uh, she appreciates that question. Um, <laughs> knowing the members of the committee who have asked that. Um, and she would, you know, she would exhaust every piece of the money from every part of her budget before she would come back and ask for um, the budget um, for any reserve transfer budget um, for, and this was in regards to the three-year benchmark study that happens every year. Um, but it, it depends upon the timing of the training. Um, uh, so, you know, she's making her best estimate at this point. Um, and uh, and she wants to, the committee to know that she wants to do as good a job as, and ask for the money that she needs now. So um, I hope that answers that question. Um, the other question that came up was around the assessors, around the, the conversation about the town clerk salary. Um, and I can break down, uh, so it was both the, the town clerk's salary um, as well as the, um, the director of libraries. So first off, the town clerk's salary um, is set by the town meeting. So uh, the criteria for the salary range for that department head um, is set by uh, a different set of standards um, than an elected official. Um, so if we wanted to make any sort of changes in uh, in the, that town clerk study, um, we would have to go through town meeting. So that would be the appropriate way um, to address that salary. Um, and she also wanted to make note that the HR director, um, oh yeah, so, oh, sorry, to that point, the HR director so doesn't manage you know, the select boards budget or anything that's all, um, they're a different classification system. Uh, and uh, the question was also raised, Makai, about the library director. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, so um, that is that is through the pay and classification system. Um, and that system was uh, that designed in the year 2000. Um, and you know, sh you know. First of all, um, they it's you know the way that she described it is that it's it's a living um, document that gets um, upkeeped upkeep kept on a regular basis. Um, she did review the um, director of libraries' salary um, and did feel like it fell within the appropriate classification um, as it compared to the, uh, the, the benchmark study that they did um, three years ago. Um, she felt that the director of libraries um, also was able to, um, Oh, I asked within the department heads whether it like does does she compare the department head salary with um, with uh, with other department heads within the town, not just outside of the town. Um, and she does. She said it's comparable. Um, and in regards to the department uh, of the, the director of libraries' salary right now, she says it is very competitive. Um, and it's second only to Brookline in terms of compensation. Um, and her grade is in the same grade as the treasurer and comptroller and workers compensation attorney um, and the director of inspection. Uh, 
So I'll go into the, the process of, of the pay and classification um, and I'll walk us through that document. But, um, you know, Karen Malloy um, absolutely respects this, this um, committee very, very much. And so um, if it didn't, if that doesn't um, answer the question, she is um, more than willing to, to help. Um, one other point about the, the town clerk salary is that uh, the town clerk has only been with our town for 18 months or within that position, I should say, uh, for 18 months. Um, and the other managers that were mentioned, I think the town assessor was mentioned um, comparing that salary as well as another department. I think it was the HR director there. They, um, so those department heads have been in their positions for 20 years. Um, so, uh, and also they just hired someone at the same pay, pay grade um, as that manager, um, as the, the town clerk. So I hope that is thorough enough. Um, are there any questions about those salaries? Jonathan Wall, is your hand up? Uh, no. Hmm. Oh, that's, I'm sorry, that's me. With my, my hand somehow is over your, your uh, tile. Um, any, any questions for Micaiah on the subject of those department head salaries? Okay, Micaiah, I think uh, you can go charging ahead. All right. Um, I do, I do want to like honor that question because I think it's, um, it's very equitable with, um, and um, the encouragement uh, is to uh, invite any of our town department uh, employees to participate in the pay and classification application process. Um, that happens every August. Uh, so yeah. let me, um, I feel like kind of wake myself up a little bit. Um, the, so let me explain what we're looking at, <laughs> just as a review for all of us um, who have seen this in town meeting or just been in finance committee for a while. Um, so the reclassification process is really just a way to change someone's job description um, and their pay without using this step process. Uh, and the reclassification process is uh, involves both the employee, the department head. Um, it's like each person that submits their application to um, Karen Malloy uh, is their own personal investigation. So they, um, the HR director goes into what are they doing? What are they really doing? They talk to their, you know, their coworkers, the supervisors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so she showed me the stack of like, um, of papers that she has to deal with, which is great. You know, I'm, I'm glad she's very thorough. Um, and uh, so this year, Al Tosti, uh, there were 17 applicants, uh, nine were denied. So it was a very busy year. Uh, seven people appealed the decision. Um, and then the HR board um, did not overturn any of the directors um, decisions. So uh, what we go through tonight is the process of, um, of this application process or uh, of this uh, uh, reclassification process. Um, and then I think I can kind of speed through the rest of this. Um, oh, so as we go through this, I also just want to um, point out what the acronyms and designations mean because it um, is very confusing um, if you're not familiar with it. Um, or I can just send it to um, SharePoint. But they're, um, you know, the SEIU and, and the NCP, ATP, OFNU, the OA that you see, the MC, the L, those are um, those are just uh, service employee international union 
Um, those are mostly mid managers. MTP is the non union version of ATP. Um, and ATP is the administrative, technical, and professional. Um, OFNU is the Office of Administration, that's the non union. Um, MC is maintenance and craftsmen and the laborers. Um, and then L is the professional libraries, um, professional librarians. Um, so, I feel like, are there any questions? Um, so there are three pages that you see um, and the letters match uh, with the corresponding numbers or they should in most cases. So number one A uh, is the administrative assistant in planning uh, for community development. Is that correct? Someone tell me if that's correct. Yeah, planning and community development. Yep, that's right. That's, okay, thank you. Um, and then under 2A, if you scroll down to that, um, it should correspond. So number two is, is um, the positions that get added. Um, and then number three are all the positions that get deleted. So they, the, the letters should correspond appropriately, if that makes sense. Um, so we'll go through and then um, the amounts on the side that you see are the amounts that were not previously um, appropriated in last year's budget. And so what we go through tonight, um, given our you know, if we have a positive recommendation that we submit to town meeting, then that is the, the, the money that we will appropriate. All right, so I can go through this really quickly. Um, Makaya, if I could just make a comment, please. Yes. Just to clarify your most recent uh, remark. The, yep. the 1644, so when, when we present a budget to town meeting, um, that budget will include the current rate without the classification changes. Once town meeting votes the Warren article that has the classification changes, then there may be a, a dollar impact on those positions that's not covered in our normal budget. So that's what we're voting here on those, those little columns. Not for the current year, but for fiscal 23. Correct. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. High five, Charlie. Um, okay, so number one A is the, um, we've, and we've talked about many of these positions, uh, so I think we can go through it very quickly. I'll give you the narrative, and then um, if there are any questions, I'll take it um, before the recommendation of the vote. So one A, um, this is the administrative um, assistant position, um, and really what Karen Malloy is, is uh, trying to do is to move, be consistent with both the library and the fire um, and just move these, um, these positions to be with their peers so that they're at the, um, the ATP for um, designation. Um, and this person, um, you know, they looked at the, the town benchmark study um, and the range of our position is higher um, but the current salary is not so. Um, so I think that they like we make up for it within. Um, actually, I'm not going to talk outside of my outside of my knowledge there. So um, uh, let's see. Um, so. This person in 1B, the title is being deleted and it's being moved and changed to the office management title. Um, there, you know, so when there is a vacancy, it is reviewed through uh, collective bargaining with the unions. Um, and they're working toward uh, reducing gender neutral, uh, 
creating gender neutral, neutral titles and to be more inclusive. One C, um, as you can see, the manager's job went up three steps uh, from an MTP eight to an MTP 11. Um, and the title is going to change to be the new title of sustainability manager. They looked at other communities and what they were being paid um, and they, in order to be competitive, they agreed to change the title. There was no incumbent in the, the position. Um, and, and so they won't have to, we won't have to make up the difference for when this is reviewed and classified. Um, but this request is subject to our positive recommendation and to the ratification of town meeting. So um, just note that. In 1D, uh, this, this, um, uh, this uh, position is still vacant. Um, there aren't any applicants, um, even though they changed the grade significantly. Um, and they've gone to the school committee to review it, but they still aren't getting applicants for um, these tech jobs. Um, in 1E, the watchman laborer, they moved that position. Um, they increased the administrative responsibilities to match the daytime dispatchers. Um, it is still vacant, I believe, um, and they are looking for applications. So again, the, the job market is just very challenging. Uh, 1F, the recycling. Um, so they reviewed this position outlined by the bylaws um, that they do every year in August. Um, and this person has been in this role for over a decade, for about a decade. Um, the justification here is uh, that the role has become more complex, more demanding, the amount of public uh, interface with you know, cable television, with the website, working with the state, um, they decided to change that position title. Um, uh, oh, and they manage several volunteer events. Uh, in 1G, um, I think I've already talked a lot about this in the human resources department. Um, the technical responsibilities are significant. They wire $2 million to the state, the state um, every month uh, for their affordable care reporting. Um, it seems like, uh, so they were audited um, by the IRS. Uh, there's a lot of lot at stake, a lot at risk. They're audited because uh, there's a box that was not checked that was due to a, um, a software glitch. Um, and so as a result, there was, there was an audit, but um, you know, they, they manage a lot of the, they manage all the payroll department and it's just a lot of the work. So a lot of data, a lot of judgment, I should say. Um, 1H, the park and maintenance supervisor under public works. Um, this person just has a higher level exposure to the public. Um, and in 1I and 1J, um, both the electrician and the plumber, they just have been vacant positions for one year. Uh, one person just got, uh, one person just uh, applied as of last week. Um, and, you know, even though the town has significant benefits and um, stability, just graduates from vocation schools are just making double or triple the amount that they can use, so. Are there any questions about? Um... So any, any questions for Micaiah on these uh, recommended changes to the pay, pay classification system? You'll notice that she answered the, uh, the Altasti question of um, <clears throat> how many applications were there? There were 17, nine, um, nine were, were uh, approved and uh, seven were not approved. Did I have that right? Um, no, 17 were applied. Yeah, 17 applied. 
nine were rejected. Nine were rejected, right. And they were unsuccessful. Uh, seven appealed, yeah. Oh, so, uh, two of the, so two of the rejections were approved by the... Uh... Um, no, so um, 10 were approved out of the, the, the seven that were not approved. Oh, 10 and seven, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and none of the uh, people that appealed were accepted, so. Correct. <clears throat> and the total uh, impact on the salary scale is uh, mm -hmm. it's about, uh, what's that, uh, 4,000, probably $5,000 overall. So uh, we have a, somebody has a mute problem, I think here. It could be my um, computer fan. I apologize. Ah. Let oh, me. Um, your let computer me... Well, we can't mute you, Makaya, because you're talking. <laughs> Unfortunately, sorry. I'll try to move my um, the fan. That's okay. I'll just hold it for a second. Any questions? Well, I... yes, oh. George Koser and Alan Jung. First, George. Thank you, Makaya, for a, a very clear explanation of all these things. I was just looking, um, the first six positions in section one, reclassifying following positions, seem to have a corresponding deletion in section three. And the last four, G through J, don't seem to have a deletion. And I'm just wondering how this all works. If we've reclassified a position from one grade to another, um, is there a rule for deleting the uh, former grade? Yeah, that is a, a very good question. Um, uh, do you mean deleting the position, not the grade? Yes. Um, in, yeah, so I, I, I left off a couple of positions, like some in one, or sorry, in 2J, for instance, uh, the mental health clinician, um, that was um, that was added um, because there was no funding um, or the fee, you know they were being funded by the fees um, and you know just reviewing it they had to add it to add it to the pay plan because they are not contractors um, so they the numbers don't always the letters don't always correspond. Um, but there is there is reasoning. So and then there's another instance where a position was deleted because they they lost their funding. So and that um, yeah. So as, as as best as possible, they correspond. But um, good eye. Um, I don't know if I answer that question at all. Oh, and then another instance in 2M, I didn't mention that, but the, um, they were able to coach another public, pu public health nurse from a different community. So now we have two public health nurse, nurses, um, one that's gonna now manage another nurse. Um, and, and anytime the host, uh, town hosts like a clinic, we're working under, you know, the license of that, that public health nurse. Um, so we, we feel really lucky to have two public health nurses, um, but that doesn't necessarily correspond with a reclassified position. That's fine, thanks. Okay. okay. Alan Jones. Thank you. Um, this this isn't a uh, vote on a budget. It's it's uh, money appropriated through a warrant article, and of course we just you know we need a number uh, to appropriate for that. And I noticed in the budget book it's uh, the number is eleven thousand eight ninety one, and I think adding these numbers up it's fourteen thousand six sixty. So just wanted to you know clarify what the number was that uh, we're recommending appropriation. Yes, I noted that too. Where did where did you get the eleven thousand eight hundred ninety one? Uh, that's from page one ninety six of the budget book. Okay. You know, and and, and to be fair, 
it uh, the budget book very often doesn't match the reclassification just because of the timing but i just wanted to be clear when we vote you know what what number we're voting for that uh, warrant article thank you grant gibbon um yes thank you charlie um this may not necessarily a reclass question but regarding to the difficulty in hiring um are, do we have any requirements that the uh, any of these uh, employees need to reside in Arlington? Oh, that that's a good question. Um, if, does anybody else uh, know the, uh, the, the, the role? It's a, I have to reside in Arlington. All righty, thank you. Um, Makaya, do you have the total number, Makaya? So, so, so I think um, since we don't have a warrant article number. Let, let's just say that um, you, would you make a motion that the pain classification plan be adjusted in a future warrant article by fourteen thousand six hundred and sixty dollars? So moved. Second. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded based on the presentation by Micaiah on the pain classification plan that the uh, plan be increased by $14,660 uh, under a warrant article to be designated uh, in the near future. And uh, any further discussions on this? Uh, Charlie? Yes, Alan. I always ask that question or somebody always asks that question about the number of applicants, the number approved, the number rejected and appealed. And uh, it, it's, it's nice to know that our long-term uh, human resource director hasn't turned into an old softy and that the uh, board of appeals backs her. So it's- a Yeah, good she's, a, she's as hard as nails. We know that. <laughs> okay, thank you, Alan. So um, it's been moved and seconded for uh, $14,660 and there's no further uh, questions. We'll to so we'll vote, roll call it's vote. Just, this could be a vote. Okay. Um, Grant Gibbion? Yes. Shane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Makaya Healy? Yes. Uh, Arif Padaria? Yes. Sophie Migliazzo? Yes. Migliazzo. Sophie, I think you're on mute. Yes or no? Are you? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jonathan Wallach. Yes. Shailene is not here. Daryl Harmer. Yes. Uh, Annie is not here. Alan Jones. Yes. George Koser. George Koser. Yes. George, yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Bill Keller. Uh, yes. Wanda Nascimento. Yes. Christine, uh, Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. So the vote is unanimous on the pay classification plan. Thank you very much. Charlie, I think any other budgets that people want to uh, bring tonight? Uh, yeah, I think um, Al, Al Tosti and I could do the uh, assessor budget. 
Um, Thank you. I, I, yes, that's I, sh I think I apparently skipped over that before. Go right ahead, Bill. OK, Al, are you there? Before you start, Charlie, I think you skipped me, but it's a yes. OK. Uh, I apologize for that. No problem. I'm sorry if I jumped in too soon. Nope. Go ahead, Bill. OK. So um, yesterday, uh, Al Tosti and myself uh, met with um, Dana Mann. Dana Mann, he's the interim director of assessments. Uh, previous director of assessments, Paul Tierney, that had that position for, I think, at least six or seven years. He left to go someplace else uh, the end of December. And uh, present at our meeting uh, were sent both Sandy Pooler and Julie Wayman, our two deputy town managers. Um, so uh, before I jump into the budget page, I think there was one or two questions that came up from uh, members of the committee. And uh, I wanted to see if I can address them. One of the questions was, uh, is the equipment on the town's utility slash telephone poles like cable TV, internet being captured for taxation by our assessors? And uh, it's a little bit of a complicated um, answer in that uh, Sandy said that 90% of the value, the valuation of these services that are attached to our polls in our town are being captured by Patriot and also are being evaluated by the Commonwealth. They have their own system. Commonwealth figures out how much goes to the town and then the town of Arlington applies a tax rate for these. Um, the problem is, as I understood it, is that this is all in litigation. So while we might have a value for the services or for the, the value of this equipment that's on our poles, uh, we're not actually collecting any money at the current time. Um, the other question that came up is, um, do we have funds set aside for um, the, assess the assessor's inspection of properties? And for this, I uh, asked directly and got a response because sometimes there's confusion. I know there's confusion on my part. I still, I confess, um, uh, I don't fully grasp all the times when we use uh, things like assessment and valuation and um, abatements. But I wanna say that the next, the town inspections are done every 10 years. We uh, had the last town wide inspection program in 2018. So we'll have the next one done again, roughly 2028. Uh, it's these town-wide inspections of properties that are costly and cost around $300,000. Uh, the last one done had a remainder of uh, cash left over of $29,965. So there's no appropriation. There's nothing we have to really decide um, as a committee in terms of funds to be used for uh, an inspection at this time. If there are further questions on that, I'd be happy, or Al and I would be happy to answer them. Yeah, there, there's a balance of about $28,000, $30,000 from the last appropriation. Um, and these appropriations are taken from overlay surplus, so they don't directly impact the budget. Right. But um, the question did come up, I guess, from the floor. So uh, that, that's. Yeah, uh, but Al, I think occasionally. Um, they're, they're in a uh, Warren article, and it's a Warren article that can carry the money forward. That's right. Okay, so- uh, any, any questions on the assessors? Uh, well, let's take the fir personnel first. Any uh, questions on the personnel side? No questions, okay. Um, any questions for Bill or Al on the um, expenses? I actually was going to go down the the assessor salaries. I'll go right ahead. Uh, in case any questions came up. But uh, if you go back to the first page, please. Okay, thanks. So uh, salaries and wages, um, first of all, there was just a small typo 
if you look at the 2023 budget, it says 287,118. Um, uh, the salary details is actually correct at 288,118. So they're gonna correct uh, that typographical error. It doesn't substantially change that line item. So in fact, uh, there's a drop of 7.12%, and that is largely uh, due to the fact that um, the previous director of assessments has left and a new one is being interviewed as we speak. So they'll come in at a lower level and uh, there'll be a savings at least for, uh, for, that, for that line of uh, $22,012. Uh, over time, so Bill, what is it? What is the new salary number for um, fifty one hundred for two thousand twenty three? Uh, ninety seven thousand eight ninety two is the salary for the next director of assessment. No, no, no. I'm I'm saying the total salary number on fifty one hundred. What is that number? It says twenty seven one one eight. Uh, 288,118. So as so a typographical error, it, it should say 288, it says 287,118. Okay, so before we go forward though, let me ask, um, is, the, is the sum on the bottom 291,393 correct? Yes. Al Jones, do you have your magic calculator there? I, I think the uh, I think Bill the two eighty seven one eighteen is correct because that includes a thousand dollars of longevity, which is down on another line on the above above. Okay. The longevity is broken out above, but it's included in the two eighty eight one eighteen. Right. The, the, the number that carries over from the salary detail to the summary sheet is the number under new pay, not the number under total. Okay. So that's the 287-118. My mistake. Thank you, guys. So the 287-118 is correct. And the 288 down below is correct also because there it's including the uh, other items for longevity and so forth. Um, Actually, the new pay column includes base step and uh, base of step, but not longevity. Okay. Yeah, it's confusing. Base and step. Thanks. Uh, in terms of overtime, uh, it's a thousand dollars, and basically, it's used uh, for emergencies only, um, and uh, there's no actual yet uh, for year to date, but. Um, if uh, emergencies or if the assessors have to spend extra time over and above their, their daily or daily routine. Uh, longevity, again, it's a decrease there and that was reflective of the prior uh, director of assessments, uh, salary and longevity. Uh, stipends are used for cleaning and uniform. Uh, line 5161 is an auto allowance. And uh, that was actually down below in in-state travel line 5209 and uh, was pulled out and given a new line item for the first time this year uh, of $1,000. Dropping down to expenses, uh, the computer maintenance, 20,500. This is uh, the same as last year and roughly the same as the year before. The Patriot software is uh, one of two software companies that uh, works with assessors across the Commonwealth and roughly half or just over half of the towns utilize the uh, Patriot software contract. And what this really is, is uh, the real estate values are market driven using this uh, computer system. Uh, In-state travel, 
meetings and conferences with other towns and uh, Massachusetts uh, assessor associations. Office supplies, um, basically it's just a safe number uh, to put out there for office supplies. Uh, otherwise un unclassified. Uh, this includes the Acro Acrobat Pro licensing fees for, um, for the assessors. And uh, I guess that's it. So are there any questions? I have one issue that I just wanted to raise. Al, Al, Al John Ellis has his hand up. Hang on one second. Oh, I'm sorry. John? John Ellis, you're mute. Sorry, Al, go ahead. I'll hold my question till you're, till, till you're done, Al. Okay, I just wanted to make a comment that uh, the assessor's $4,900 um, I, I don't see any reason why they should make more money than the selectmen or the school committee. Um, the number of meetings and the length of the meetings are, are, I think, far less than they go through. What happened years ago, probably 20 years ago, 25 years ago, the assessors made a motion uh, to, to increase their salary to 5000 and it just wasn't discussed. It just went through, um, and uh, and it got knocked down to forty nine hundred at the suggestion of the finance committee, because if you're elected and you make five thousand dollars, you're eligible for the pension. You get health insurance. It really is very costly, uh, and so the assessors agreed to go down to forty nine hundred, uh, so they're they're not eligible for pension or health insurance. Um, I, I don't know, you know, you've got two new assessors coming on board this year. I don't know if the finance committee wants to pick a fight about it. Um, I'm just sort of raising the issue, uh, th that it, it seems a higher amount of money, uh, when you compare it to the selectmen and the, and the coming salary of the school committee, I suppose the assessors would say that you know, they have to go through a lot more training while the selectmen and school committee are just general policy makers. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, the office is run by the, by the uh, uh, general assessor under the control of the town manager. Um, so they, you know, I don't think they really have much to do with, the, uh, with that process anymore. I, I just throw out the observation. I don't know if anybody wants to like I said, pick a fight about it for a couple thousand bucks. Um, but it was just an observation on my part. So uh, now my house is going to be rebound higher, but you know. John, John Ellis. Uh, thanks. So uh, Bill, could you clarify the, the um, you, you said that the telephone poles and the equipment on it was tracked by the state and also Patriot, but it's tied up, up in litigation litigation for, for between who and who and what what's the deal and how much money is at stake and, and then i have one more question after that yeah well um i don't have a lot of informational litigation uh sandy poor as i said sat in on this meeting so when this question was asked i'm happy he was there uh because he said um the, our patriot system is by its nature capturing the value of uh of this equipment that is owned, say, by Verizon or Comcast. And the Commonwealth also knows that this is an issue statewide. And they convey back to the town what they figure is our valuation for what we have on telephone poles and utility poles in our town. But then we have to apply the tax rate and we have to collect it. So I think the litigation is. Um, between the town or the Commonwealth <laughs> and these companies that have their commercial um, equipment um, on our poles. I'm just going to throw out the, the name Verizon or Comcast or what have you. So uh, I don't really know too much beyond that. 
and I'd be happy to inquire further if uh, you'd like me to. It's yeah, I'd just be cu curious how much money it is. You know, is, is it is the town going to get five hundred thousand dollars a year or five thousand dollars a year when this is resolved? I don't know but, the answer but, to that. But I'd be curious. That and then the follow up question is related to gas lines. Um, my street's been torn up. Um, Feeney Brothers is a contractor for Grid. Uh, Pleasant Street's just been torn up. I imagine these projects are, you know, in the order of millions of dollars. Um, I assume the gas lines are probably fully depreciated since they went in 1900. Um, are gas lines and utilities underground a taxable asset that the town can um, get revenue on? And um, and and since uh, since we're getting all these new gas lines and there's all this uh, changes are are you know will that what's the impact of that? What kind of income will the town see on that? Was my follow up question. I don't know if you know that, Bill, or someone else. Um, I don't know, that. but I. I don't know that, uh, but I did make a note to see if the, the new gas lines that are placed underground, if the town can draw revenue from these. And uh, I'll go back to the uh, to our assessor tomorrow and ask that question. Thanks. Try to get an answer for you. Thank you. Sophie, before you go, I think um, I think David had his his yeah, voice. I was, I, right. I, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to get over to Dave because I think he wanted to talk. Dave McKenna? Yes, uh, if David I could, uh, just to go back to Alan's point on the assessors yeah. and the stipend. Okay. Um, that goes back many, many years ago when the assessors, the three elected positions, which is still elected, that goes back when they themselves used to go uh, section to section of the town and do evaluations. And they put in that, that because they were putting so much time individually, that's why they raised um, the issue at town meeting. So if one would want to change that, they'd have to file a, a warrant article um, to reduce that that stipend. Um, I, I don't know if anybody anybody is, would want to do that, but that's and because they were elected officials, the job over the years have certainly changed. A lot of it's now done by computer and consultants. But the stipend came came years ago when the assessors themselves would, would go view property after property. That's just a little historical where that all came from. That sounds right. So Al, if you would like to um, um, make a motion to uh, go after that stipend, uh, you know this is the time to do it. Yeah. I, I I'm just not sure. Is, is, your, uh, is your is your is uh, your uh, house on the um, public list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just voiced a concern. I'm not sure it's worthwhile. You know, the, the assessing their primary role now is to evaluate uh, appeals on assessments and grant exemptions. I mean, I th think that's what their main job is now. Um, I suppose it would be interesting to see how much elected assessors get in other towns. Um, that would be a good I, I don't know project for, for the operation. That would be a good project for the operations research group. I Isn't guess. there an Al Tosti rule about when someone makes a suggestion? Yeah, that's what I just did. Yeah, he did. There you go. <clears throat> there you go. <laughs> okay. So you got to be very careful the issues you so, raised in this committee. Let's, let's go back to the uh, uh, budget at hand. So, uh, Bill Keller, you have a budget in front of us here. What is your recommendation? Um, my recommendation is that we move to accept the budget as printed of $323,641. And do I have a motion? Is there a second? Second. So it's been moved and seconded for uh, $323,641. Um, is there any further discussion? Oh, yes, George Koser, sorry. Um, I did a quick look on the state website and the uh, current valuation of uh, Verizon and other equipment in Arlington is $18,872,300. About 12 and a half million of it is Verizon. 5 million is RCN and then there's little cats and dogs. 
So that's the ballpark number is, is almost $19 million. Uh, having worked for one of these companies for a long time, <laughs> they're in litigation with states constantly. Um, but eventually municipalities do get their do get their money. So it's not relevant to whether we vote this up or down, but trying to answer um, the question of, is this $500 or $5,000? Um, it's it's uh, almost $19 million worth of property. Thank you. Thanks. I'd wanna be a lawyer, I guess, but. Oh, uh, John Ellis, does that answer your question? So I, I did know, uh, I was aware that the largest taxable business property in the town is are those poles. Um, and that's where most of the, the, the non-property tax money comes from. Um, so I was just, but, but I would, I'm a little surprised. I, I don't think it's all held up in litigation. I mean, that's several hundred thousand dollars a year, I think. So I guess I just, I know it does not answer my question. I'm still yeah. wondering because we are collecting, I believe we're collecting money, but but maybe there's some discrepancy over how much. Okay, I, so that, you want to know how much is being collected and how much is being withheld because of the litigation. Well, yeah, like what what are we arguing over? Like, yeah. yeah. Okay, got it. Oh, have that I'm, bill. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry to say I made some notes and I'll make further notes to go back and uh, get more information about how much of this these equipment's being captured, how much being taxed and how much we're actually, the town is recovering and how much might still be in litigation. Yep. Does that sound yep. okay? Yes, thanks. Sounds good, okay. Any other uh, questions on this budget? Okay, so it's been moved and seconded for uh, $323,641. There's no further discussion in front of us. So we'll move to a vote on the assessor's budget. Grant Gibeon. Yes. Shane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Kaya Healy? Yes. Um, Arif Padaria? Yes. Sophie Migliazzo? Yes. Jonathan Wallach? Yes. Daryl Harmer? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. George Koser? Yes. Bill Keller? Yes. Al Tosti? Yes. Wanda Nascimento? Yes. Christine Deschler? Yeah. Dean Carmen? Yes. And David McKenna? Yes. Thank you. Uh, that is the unanimous vote for the assessor's budget uh, by all the members present uh, this evening. So um, <clears throat> we are eight minutes from um, the, the magic hour here. Are there any uh, further budgets that people would want to bring forward? Seeing none, a, mo a motion to adjourn is in order. So moved. Second. Seconded. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. I can see everybody's hands up. So the meeting is adjourned. Nice to see you, Arif. Have a good day. Good to see you guys. Take Bye. care, Arif. Good night, everybody. Bye, Arif. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.